A few years ago, I ran across this cool meme, a collection of some of the strongest female characters from science fiction, fantasy, and action adventure. This is not the one, I couldn't find the one that I saw, but this is one that looks a lot like it. The format's the same, and I recognized lots of faces. Some of them were household names, like Wonder Woman and Princess Leia, that anyone would recognize. And a few, gratifyingly, were obscure characters only a select few would get, like Firefly's Zoe Washburn. But one face I was decidedly frustrated not to see was Laura Dern's Ellie Sattler. Because it seems like Ellie Sattler has never gotten the credit she is due from the larger pop culture community. Of course, I say this as a Jurassic Park fan, but it is honestly surprising that when lists are made of female empowerment role models in the genre, she is almost never so much as mentioned. Laura Dern's portrayal is a perfect blend of femininity, strength, vulnerability, and intelligence. Hi, I'm Brian I. Welcome to Jurassic Kingdom, and today we're digging into why it is Dr. Ellie Sattler rarely ranks among the greatest heroines in movie history, and why she absolutely should. Before we can look at why Ellie is so often overlooked, we have to examine why she shouldn't be. Taking a step back, the character of Ellie Sattler appears in one of the biggest, most influential films of all time. As I love to remind people, Jurassic Park was the highest grossing film of all time from 1993 all the way up until Titanic took the honor in 1997. That means a whole lot of eyes were on this movie. It isn't some indie darling or an obscure dollar store bin double feature. This was an enormous production with an insanely successful theater run. Ellie's actions were viewed by a big audience and act she does. Ellie is introduced first as the romantic love interest to our intrepid main character, Dr. Alan Grant. But we quickly learn that she is also an accomplished scientist in her own right. Within minutes of meeting her, we know that she is extremely intelligent. Oh, postmortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. She is very much in love with Dr. Grant, and that she wants to be a mother with her exceedingly reluctant beau. It's... You want to have one of those? We also know she is more than happy to jump headfirst into a confrontation with helicopter flying a-holes. Okay, who's the jerk? Ellie further demonstrates her knowledge when she identifies an extinct plant moments before her world is turned upside down by the appearance of the Brachiosaurus. And she shows her unflinching integrity when she gives her honest first impression, unprompted, to the man signing the paychecks that keep the dig site back in Montana open. Throughout the narrative, we see these aspects of Ellie's character shine brighter and brighter. In a stroke of very clever foreshadowing and character development, Ellie's bravery is actually hinted at several times before she makes her first choice to put herself in a dangerous situation. The entrance into the trailer without knowing the context and the upfront honesty in the conference room we've already discussed. But then there is her willingness to jump out of a moving vehicle, and of course her drive to stick her hands right into Triceratops crap to get to the bottom of a medical mystery, and her subsequent choice to stay with the dinosaur as a tropical storm bears down on the cast. So it really does not present as out of character to the audience when Ellie abruptly volunteers to help Robert Mulden retrieve the stranded visitors, despite knowing what may be at stake, that the entire park was without the power it relied on to keep from descending into chaos. To that point in the narrative, Ellie and Muldoon were the only ones consistently acting with bald-faced bravery. In point of fact, some of the other main characters have either demonstrated or been defined by their fears. Grant, her boyfriend, is afraid to become a father, citing his disdain for children, and we can infer further that he fears losing Ellie over it, which the sequels will bear out. He also has to be comforted by Ellie when he becomes so emotional at the revelation dinosaurs once again walk the earth that he becomes physically ill. 
Malcolm fears the genetic power Hammond and Wu can now use on an unprepared and unsuspecting world. Gennaro's very first appearance is marked by fear, the fear of falling off the raft, and his own fears later lead him to abandon the children and eventually get him killed. Ray Arnold is the personification of anxiety, worrying about everything and chain smoking for comfort. I'm not saying that these characters aren't brave, uh, Gennaro being the exception. Both Grant and Malcolm are willing to put their lives on the line for children they barely know. Ray Arnold runs off alone to restore power to the park later in the film. What I am saying is that Ellie Sattler is consistently shown to be courageous in the face of uneven odds. Muldoon is asked to venture out into the unknown by his boss. Ellie, in contrast, volunteers to go in a tone that dares anyone to challenge her about it, and no one presents a single ounce of resistance. Because it's clear to the other characters and the audience that Ellie can handle what may be to come. And that isn't to say Ellie is some stoic, unemotional robot meant to be cool and badass under pressure. Quite the opposite. She is shown to be almost panicked in her search for Grant, and sounds like she herself is going to vomit when they discover Gennaro's remains, though she ultimately is able to keep her food down. A neat little contrast to Grant immediately losing his stomach over just finding out that the park boasts a Tyrannosaur. Minutes later, while being chased by the Tyrannosaur, we see the contrast between Muldoon and Ellie, and Malcolm, for that matter. Where Muldoon is almost calm during the scene, no doubt due to experience, and Malcolm makes quips as a defensive mechanism, Ellie is overtly terrified, screaming and cursing, which is something I'll discuss shortly, by the way. In any case, when it's all done, she gives these heavy, panting sighs where the other two are much more composed. At first glance, one may be convinced that this shows Ellie being another stereotypical damsel in distress, but this is a moment where Laura Dern chooses specifically to have Ellie believe she is, in fact, about to die, and portrays her character as such. Why? Because Ellie's choices later on will be that much more impressive because we know she is scared. This character is having a very traumatic weekend, and it shows but she is also capable of overcoming that fear to do what needs to be done. Nelson Mandela echoed the sentiments of Ambrose Hollingsworth Redmond when he said, Courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And that is Ellie's characterization throughout the narrative. She is always acutely aware of the danger she is in, but chooses to do the right thing every time. Ellie's next two scenes demonstrate her versatility and intelligence, as she is the one who takes charge of Malcolm's care, cleaning his wounds and administering morphine, but also her commitment to honesty and compassion. The entire scene in the dining room is the best non-action set piece of the film, and is a masterclass of both acting and dialogue, showcasing Richard Attenborough and Laura Dern as powerhouses. It's also directed beautifully by Steven Spielberg and scored perfectly by John Williams. This underrated scene shows off every facet of Dr. Ellie Sattler, her competence, her academic brilliance, her compassion, her bravery, her vulnerability. She remains here dedicated to confronting John Hammond, likely the wealthiest and most powerful man she has ever met, about the consequences of his own hubris. She reveals she herself did not fully understand or respect what Jurassic Park truly represented. And now that it's all come crashing down, all the bells and whistles have been stripped away, leaving just what matters most. The people we love. Ellie does not berate Hammond like a detached school teacher. Her frustration with him is more akin to an argument between close friends, where she allows her own emotions to bubble to the surface. She does not fear these feelings, nor does she seem ashamed in showing them, as many of her fellow characters seem to be. Which leads us into the third act, where Ellie exhibits all of the elements of her character at their highest levels yet. Bit by bit, brick by brick, the narrative has built her up to endure her most extreme challenges, and although we know she's capable, we also know she is not superhuman. Her vulnerabilities have been as highlighted as the qualities that make her such a proficient and admirable character. And so we fear for her as we root for her, because any moment could be her last. Ellie starts Act 3 as the first to realize that Ray Arnold's mission to restore the park's power had most likely failed. 
She subsequently, breathlessly, volunteers to go finish the job. In a clever reversal of the earlier scene, Muldoon says that he's going with her, but this doesn't take away from the fact that she wasn't asked or forced to go, nor did she ask for permission. She simply states, I'm gonna go get the power back on. And even when confronted with the fact that the three Velociraptors are loose, Ellie's resolve doesn't break. Compare the reactions to the news between Ellie and Muldoon. The latter is stoic, composed, while Ellie begins to almost hyperventilate and fearfully mutter to herself. Here we see Muldoon's self-possessed overconfidence, the hallmark of any quote-unquote badass character. In stark contrast to Ellie's more realistic danger response, again, Laura Dern is showing her character's bravery because despite Ellie clearly knowing the much more menacing nature of their mission than she did when she volunteered, at no point does she waver in her conviction. I have to point this out, but this isn't her fight. No one would have batted an eye if the guest of this park took a step back and let the employees of this madhouse handle everything. But that's not who Ellie is, and she's willing to do everything that must be done so she and Alan and everyone else gets to go home. The next few scenes of Ellie are her action scenes, the running and jumping and all of that, which are typically reserved for the action movie main character. More on that in a moment. But what I find even more fascinating, and what is often overlooked, is that Ellie seems to have some rudimentary knowledge of how to operate a computer. Early in the movie, she laughs at Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. And seems at ease with Ray Arnold's descriptions of what Dennis Nedry did inside the system. This was all to set up the fact that when they enter the control room at the end of the film, it is Ellie who is about to reboot the system. Lex ends up doing it because Ellie, ever the woman of action, springs to lend her weight to the door to prevent the raptor incursion. And now we come to the finale. And by this time, the character of Ellie has undergone a very subtle change. Where she had previously screamed in the face of outright danger, as she did with the Rex in the Jeep and the Raptor in the Shed, Ellie is more composed in the finale. Look at her reaction to the Raptor appearing from behind the tarp. That is Muldoon-level stoicism. She has become the action movie star, a transformation made visual by her clothes. When she leaves the shed and collapses with emotion, overwhelmed by the trauma of seeing body parts, chased by carnivorous dinosaurs, and facing the possibility the man she loved was likely dead, she is wearing her pink overshirt. Pink in our modern era is shorthand for femininity and all things girly and Barbie. The very next time we see her, and without any in-film explanation, she has shed that garment to reveal the purple tank top underneath. Purple being the melding of both red, or pink, and blue. The film is subtly letting us know that Ellie has undergone a change, where she is adopting the stone-faced, hard-edged persona that marks many main characters. We know that Ellie Sattler displays several qualities which are traditionally given to male characters, but that doesn't mean she isn't feminine. The clothes she wears show off her figure, and I'd like to point out that while Dr. Grant literally only changes his overshirt for the trip to Nubler, Ellie seems like she has taken a shower and put on a whole new wardrobe. She even brings a backpack, likely full of both her toiletries and grants. This is traditionally female behavior. She welcomes and seems pleased with Ian Malcolm's blatant advances to her. She wants to be a mom and loves watching Grant grow uncomfortable in the presence of adoring children. This character doesn't shy away from her femininity any more than she shies away from her more masculine traits. This balance is further demonstrated one last time before the characters are fully safe. As she and Grant rush the kids out of the visitor center, notice what she's doing. She is carrying Tim. The mother's urge to protect a child, but also the physicality of carrying an eight-year-old boy, despite the fact that, to this point, Grant has been the children's primary protector. If anyone should be carrying Tim, it's the guy who did it following the incident at the perimeter fence. Finally, our last shot of Ellie is one that reminds us of her transformation. She has combed her hair, somehow, but her face shows a combination of exhaustion, of amusement, and deep trauma. This is the face of a person who has seen too much in too short a time, and where previously she might have been overjoyed to see her boyfriend have a come-to-Jesus moment about the possibility of having children with her, she seems almost sad. Like, perhaps she is rethinking everything. 
We never find out why it is Ellie Sattler and Alan Grant drift away from one another, but there might be the tiniest clue in Ellie's countenance in the final moments of the film. It's as if she is wondering why it took something so distressing to finally, possibly, change Grant's mind. And perhaps, too, it is not Grant, but she herself who is discovering what she needs and wants, and that Alan Grant may not be the one to provide them to her at this moment in time. I don't think it's too much of a secret that Jurassic Park has a very strong current of female empowerment coursing through it, and Ellie is one of the primary reasons for this. It never builds itself as a girl power movie, even in an era where the meme of strong female characters was just starting to become a selling point for movies. Hollywood began testing the waters with the idea of women not being simple damsels in distress for male heroes to save over and over in the 70s and 80s with huge characters like Princess Leia, Ellen Ripley in the Alien movies, and Sarah Connor in the Terminator franchise. But by the time the mid-90s came about, promotional materials for movies would go to great lengths to say things to the effect that the female characters in this movie were strong or really smart or could handle themselves in a fight. Jurassic Park had none of that. The focus was almost exclusively on the dinosaurs and the special effects. But it cannot be denied that when one takes a moment to really examine the themes of the movie, it becomes inescapable that female empowerment was baked into the narrative. This, by the way, is not a theory I came to myself. I'm afraid I don't know who to cite here, but I will do my best to point out why I subscribe to their theory. Of course, we've already gone over all that Ellie did in the film and why. You don't have to squint to see, in a way, she is the main action character. She goes through the disgusting trouble of sifting through triceratops dung to play detective. She ventures out into the park to rescue survivors. She turns the power back on. She was about to reboot the system. In the meantime, what's her boyfriend doing? Dr. Alan Grant is the actual main character of Jurassic Park, and although he does get a lot of action scenes, they are always to the same end protect the children. Traditionally speaking, child care is a female role, and the main male character spends two-thirds of the movie doing it, while the female character is actually trying to fix what's wrong. This reversal of roles was intentional, largely to gather character development momentum for Grant, but the filmmakers could easily have made Muldoon or Malcolm the primary action figure, but they instead chose for Ellie to carry it through. Do yourself a favor, too, and count how many curse words are used in Jurassic Park, and note who uses them the most. If you guessed Samuel L. Jackson, you'd be wrong. I'll save you the trouble. Ray Arnold and Grant tie for second place, with five profane words each. Ellie has seven. I would be remiss to point out that Lex also is given a tomboyish personality. In the first place, she is also introduced in patterned shades of purple with a baseball cap, a holdover from her much more tomboyish novel counterpart. But we also learn that she is proficient with and knowledgeable about technology, Grant's nemesis. Her brother, Tim, in fact, spends most of the movie getting saved by either Grant or her. She's a better climber than he is, proven in the perimeter fence scene, and she's shown to be capable of outwitting velociraptors during the kitchen scene. Speaking of the kitchen scene, only one character in the entire movie can claim to have killed a dinosaur, and that is Lex. You could make the argument that Tim lured it into the freezer, though I think that he was just trying to get away himself, but that ploy would have failed if Lex hadn't temporarily neutralized the big one long enough to close the door by herself on the freezer raptor and lock it inside. Side note, it seems that Jurassic Park Survivor is going to retroactively steal this kill from Lex, but let's just assume that the writers of Jurassic Park didn't look 31 years into the future to see what a video game developer would change about what's canon. They chose to make Lex the one who killed a dinosaur. And they also chose Lex, not Tim as in the novel, to save the day by rebooting the system while Tim stood around panicking. Finally, the primary antagonists of this movie are all female. The Rex is a female, the three raptors are female, at least they might be, they are all implied to be. I'm gonna do a video about that soon where I go into my reasons, stay tuned. Hell, even that Dilophosaurus is likely female as well. When you really look at all of the evidence, and it's all laid out in front of you, it's hard to imagine the filmmakers created this theme accidentally, that they sort of stumbled into this through line, especially when you consider that dialogue within the film itself calls out what it's doing. She's, uh, 
tenacious. God creates dinosaurs. God destroys dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. Dinosaurs eat man. Woman inherits the earth. It ought to be me really going. Why? Well, I'm a, uh, and you're a, um, uh... Look. Come on, let's go. We can discuss sexism and survival situations when I get back. So why is it that Ellie Sattler fails to rank among the most important and influential female empowerment characters in film and television? Why is she so often forgotten? She is the primary action-oriented character in a movie that is designed, albeit subtly, to be a vehicle to challenge typical film gender roles. And I believe that's because, despite all that we've discussed, Ellie doesn't really have a character arc. She does develop as a character, but it's exceedingly subtle, and really only enhances aspects of her character she already possesses at the beginning of the film. Jurassic Park chooses to focus on the emotional journeys of Grant and Hammond, leaving Ellie no room for a full arc of her own. Thankfully, between Laura Dern's performance and Michael Crichton and David Kep's efficient writing, Ellie keeps from being a nothing character, but she's still playing second fiddle to Grant, and so the audience is invested more in his arc than they are in Ellie's impressive deeds. Not to mention that all of the characters were going to be overshadowed by the dinosaurs themselves. No one was heading to theaters in June of 1993 to see brilliant character work. They were going because Universal Studios had managed to resurrect convincing dinosaurs for a modern audience. But if Lost World and Jurassic Park 3 would teach us anything in the coming years, it's that the dinosaurs alone weren't what made Jurassic Park compelling. It was the characters enduring this nightmare too that made the film not only worth watching, but also worth making an instant classic, overshadowed by other characters. And the very premise of the film she occupies, Ellie Sattler remains both a convincing character and a powerful female figure. She is a surprisingly complex woman, avoiding easy characterization and portrayed by a talented and underrated actress. Laura Dern's paleobotanist deserves a spot on every list of powerful women in the genres of science fiction, action adventure, and fantasy. It is a travesty that she is not recognized for her accomplishments and her depiction. Let me know what you think down in the comments. As ever, I ask that you keep things respectful. This may be, somehow, a controversial topic, and while I invite constructive criticism or meaningful debate, I won't be entertaining crude, demeaning, or hateful language or rhetoric. Please keep it polite and keep it positive. If you enjoyed this video, please pump up the primary handle three times and press the like button. And also maybe think about subscribing for more thoughtful Jurassic topics. I'm Brian I. This is Jurassic Kingdom. Later, nerds. Yay, we did one! Okay, hit the red button.